So the epiphany for me was in about 03, I started realizing that um, a higher value in entertainment was minutes created rather than boxes sold. So to go from um, you know a POS instance to minutes, and once I got onto the minutes, and I realized uh, subscription TV pays attention to minutes, um, and that's kind of a precursor to games now, which are becoming a caveat vendor freemium business. But um, and then at the same time, I was on school boards and teaching some stuff, and. Uh, so the, after the first epiphany of um, time matters, the second thing is that all self-improvement uh, requires user engagement. So user engagement is kind of the cornerstone of self-improvement. And um, so many of the things that we were doing to try to get people to play more Madden football, play it the whole season, play it in the off season, and um, uh, buy a package next year and basically convert your fraternity to a forever Madden football, um, factory. Um, we found we were, the same thing was going on in schools where I now hear professors realizing that the old way of lecturing doesn't work for uh, millennials anymore. Um, it's certainly obvious to me that uh, all personal fitness trainers um, try to convince you the discipline of regular engagement. Somebody Googles lower back pain and if you can get them to engage twice with a specialist or even with a, um, a Google article, their expected payout against them goes down. So uh, medicine and now with um, Mango Health, which is daily prescription adherence, um, certainly is the case with uh, uh, diabetics, people with chronic disease. You, you want every trick in the book, um, basically a scalable, perfect mom uh, to get you to do what you should on a regular basis. and. Um, and then that's against the background of, uh, of millennials who are texting uh, 300 times a week and many a day and opening up their phone 50 to 100 times a day. So the, the pace of um, background engagement that educators and medical professionals and entertainers are competing with uh, is dramatically changing. Games are the um, create the second most behavior of any human human created institution, and then in a snarky mood, I say the first, of course, is religion. Um, but the um, um, in general, um, found there's three ages of gamers. There's kind of preteen, teen, and kind of grown up. Uh, grown ups are driven by self improvement. Um, Females of all ages are driven by social. It's kind of their uh, number one or two most important productivity at all time. But grown up self improvement, teenagers self discovery, and preteens um, self control. Think about, you know, boy, if you, boys, you remember when you were 11, your body was trying to grow without you. And I heard in about 1989, one middle school boy says, You don't get it. My teacher tells me what to do, my parents tell me what to do. When I get to play a game, I tell it what to do. And they're, you know, they all want to be Arnold Schwarzenegger 40 years ago um, as they're starting to grow into muscles. In games in general, um, it's you meet the needs of the three ages. Um, social as a background is really valuable. All, all social techniques we find in all games. Um, on mobile and Facebook games, if we can get people every time they play a game to do some kind of social loop with five people, the retention soars. So, um, you know, anything you could do that creates kind of five other people that you, t five turns out to be kind of the magic, the magic number, that uh, you do something, you hear back from five other people every time you use the app. Um, there's another aspect called social obligation. Think um, anniversaries. Um, think um, if you're ever in a fraternity or sorority and you had a night where everybody had to show up. Um, so, so once you have what we call the ASN active social network of five, um, you can create a currency. Reputation is always more motivating than money um, after you pass. 
even at a, even at people whose income a dollar a day, reputation trumps money. Um, and so once you create uh, this social connectedness, um, you can create events, you can create reputation as a currency. One model of it is in a game called The Sims, which is a people game, which is kind of the watershed that after which um, um, females of our species started being gamers as kind of a normal. Um, the Sims had a relationship scale of one to 100, and there were privileges at each rank. And uh, every time you had a relationship between two Sims, numbers flew out of their heads. Who knew that girls like boys like numbers? Numbers flew out of their head. If they were green, they, um, their relationship score went toward 100. If it was red, it detracted. At 70, you got friend privileges. At 90, you got love privileges. Um, and, um, and the privilege basically just made, made you more productive. Um, and um, um, so, so that's kind of a core model of, uh, of a relationship score. I'd say the, um, um, anything that has some kind of rank, anything that has some kind of uh, esteem, um, it's kind of the social version of eBay ratings um, of the one through five stars. As executives, you know, you got to pay people, but as Leslie Box said, you know, when you're transparent about pay, it can uh, be demotivating. And I'll tell you why in a second. But the, um, um, this notion of some kind of reputation, people will do a lot for reputation, and they're less jealous about other people's reputation. The, um, so here, oh, and so another thing in games is cooperation trumps competition. It's a rookie move to think that gaming is primarily about competition um, because the only people who are motivated by competition are people who are um, close to winning. Um, so for people who are 90% who are of the way to a win or feel like they are, um, you can get a lot of behavior out of that last little bit of adrenaline. Um, we heard once from, uh, um, I'll build a, the first casual game site called Pogo Games, and it was 72% female, average age 45. And they wanted social, they wanted, they wanted achievement, they wanted kind of a brief cup of uh, coffee hit. And they would say, look, I'm kind of a loser in a lot of other places in my life. Why would I pay somebody to make me feel that way? And, you know, it's kind of worth, worth remembering. Um, I'd say the other thing we've learned in games is, as the U.S. government, democratic governments everywhere have learned, inflation is good for everyone. So, um, you know, in virtual, you can, uh, you can inflate reputation, you can inflate currencies of the people always feel like they're getting better. So, you know, it's a, you know, nobody, you know, if you're making 30 this year and you made 20 last year, people feel good whether 30 has more buying power than 20. What we've discovered in games, if you're going to do a top 10 list, you want to show people the top 10 list that they're in the top 10 of. But the other thing that games do that, that your millennial customers and uh, patients want is constant feedback and instant, instant feedback and constant improvement. So I call it live life in levels. You know, when somebody's playing World of Warcraft, every five minutes, every one minute, you're getting some kind of uh, positive score that adds up to something. And, uh, you know, when, you, when, when people leave school, school at least is on this, you improve something every year because you go up a grade. Um, and real life doesn't, doesn't create the sense of constant improvement. So it's the feedback systems get worse when they should get better. My advice is to all creative people and managers of creative people, put one customer on the wall and design for that one customer. You can spend a lot of time figuring out who the one customer is. Most creative people, the one customer is themselves. Um, and then they get rich and demotivated if they're successful and they kind of lose track of you and themselves. 
But, um, and you can, you can do it with something that looks like a Facebook profile. Um, uh, creativity tends to happen in the specific, you know. Um, stats happens in the average, and business people tend to talk in the average. Uh, never try to get your creative people to engage in, in um, averages. And then who should the one customer be? Um, my sense is the first trick is always to oversolve for one person, and after you do that, then go look for somebody else. So uh, it's either the person who's easiest or the person who's more valuable. And that's a question of how much determination you want. And psychologists would say confidence gets built on uh, small wins. Um, so, you know, trying to launch you know, launch your company with the President of the United States as your target customer um, could have some frustration. What Procter & Gamble would do is they come up with single benefits and then they will test for um, uh, most unique and most valuable. So for, for detergent it might be whitest whites, cleanest smelling, most eco-friendly, cheapest, and they will create a brand against every single one. And um, because if you test with consumers overall, if you go to, to uh, homemakers, you might get a 72% on one, a 69% on another, 67% on another. And uh, creative people have to make a binary choice. Because if you say white is white and eco-friendly, consumers get confused. So you gotta pick one. So what Procter & Gamble does, they, they, they do a brand with each one until the brand doesn't sell anymore. And, uh, you know, if they get to something that's 48% and they can't find a niche, uh, they stop doing it. But of a concept I call the million point customer. And uh, so you could start it this way. And uh, what I've found is if you give people artificial numbers, for whatever reason, getting to a million points is more motivating than any other number, at least in America. And um, so then ask yourselves, if you give a million points to a customer for buying and using and talking about your product, in six months, what would they have done? Just you, every single session they're gonna do something, every conversation they have, especially if it's measurable on your server, and add it all up. So the first thing is that as an exercise, I've never yet met a team with two people who are more within about 25% of each other when they start doing the score. So it's, a, it's wildly interesting to um, um, check your strategic assumptions. Um, and if you can't, um, I think if you can't um, visualize what really good looks like with a customer, you know, go find another customer. And then there are arguments. So there was a 1995 book called Net Gain by John Hagel, who's a McKinsey consultant. And he talks about um, uh, the value of users. And he actually uses math to differentiate what he calls the builder, the heavy user, and the light user. So most consumer companies um, value the heavy user. So the beer drinker who drinks a six pack a day, you know, a scotch drinker who, um, I don't know, uses scotch to clean his floor. Um, and um, Hegel would actually say that the builder who may or may not monetize is more valuable um, because, and what Sean Parker said in the early days of Facebook, their value is not the person who used it every day. He said in every community there was one jerk who would spam until he or she got 5,000 friends. He said these were losers, nothing better in life, but they became the megaphones. So there's a stage early on where the megaphones matter. And then um, one of the marketing people today was talking about NPS. Um, so that's kind of the overserved net promoter score. Somebody who would recommend it to friends. So John Parker said, get somebody who would recommend it to friends and does again and again and again a human spam machine. Yeah. Um, and so I would, I would, um, in consumer anyway, going after um, the most, the highest payer, um, maybe secondary to getting. Uh, um, the highest, uh, highest recommender. And, you know, we saw in things like The Sims and SimCity, what you see in Minecraft, the builders can be recommenders, but also user-generated content, content contributors like the, the uh, reviewers at Amazon. 
if you want whitest white and cheapest and all that, you go to Walmart. So Walmart's kind of that platform, but Walmart is a, is a super serving brand. Uh, but Walmart is cheapest, it's not the, um, the highest selection, and it's not the most convenient parking. So I think in the, the rule of branding is brands need to be scarily one thing with hard edges. Brands need harder edges than species do. And, um, and you almost need to feel like, well, I know it, I know it doesn't go to right there. And uh, you kill your brand if you try to make it go to right there. The, there's a different question for commerce. Um, what all commerce companies are realizing is they need algorithmic personalization. Um, and you know, I'm sure you know, you're gonna find at scale when you've got 100,000 lives, the same headline doesn't work for everybody. One of my theories actually, and this will be discovered, is that every condition and disease state might have its own math. So the fact in diabetes, I think one of the greatest things is that you have to test your blood glucose. You have to interact every day with hardware, right, and ultimately then software to what Glenn's doing. But it might be very different in heart disease where you just come down with the sudden heart attack. Or if it's cancer, there's nothing leading up till you get <coughs> diagnosed and then you're very heavy into your engagement. It might be that we find different profiles for each of these disease states. I mean, this is a theory, but, you know, so chronic, I, you know, from your standpoint is how, how often, what do they have to engage with to get to their therapy? And what that might look like might modulate very differently to each a, place. a different economy to throw into this. It's kind of the economy of productivity versus time. And, um, and we can see it on Facebook, we can see it on free to play games, we can see it in dieting, we can see it in self health that uh, my sense is humans have an internal meter of cost versus value in everything they do. And um, you know, a diet's a good example. If any of you have ever been on a diet, you know, in the first week, you're fired up about it, you have novelty going for you, you spend a certain amount, if you use MyFitnessPal, it's a certain amount of time to log all your meals. And guess what, in the first week, you can lose four or five pounds. So maybe you spend a half hour in the course of a week you lose four pounds. So now you're averaging eight pounds an hour. And then the second week you do exactly the same stuff and you lose a pound. And now you're averaging two pounds an hour. So you've just fallen in productivity by 70 hours. The next week, oh, you know, the ugly fact of diet is about the third week you don't lose much. So, um, so gamification is one way um, to maintain novelty or add some, something else. Um, and all I'll do is, so it turns out in my fitness pal, which is a, a diet thing, um, they only have 10% of the people who start using it, still using it after a month. Mm -hmm. And so now the question is, we'd like that to be 20%. If it was 20%, it would be genius. And, and prescription drugs, you know, it turns out 30% of people stop taking their pills regularly after a month. We'd like it to be. We'd like it to be only twenty percent. What do you do? It might be to what you've said before, Bing. Is you also have different engagement curves based on social and utility. So social is a higher engagement curve than utility, and then gaming is lower than that. And it could be as we talk now is that you have condition and disease state, and where you are in the life cycle of that condition and disease state. So let's take, you know, cancer for instance. You incredibly want to learn from others how their treatment patterns, you're in a social, potentially, engagement curve. And then over time, and maybe diabetics is a better example, you want to learn in the beginning, and then over time you get to a more utility because you know how to manage your disease a bit better. I'm wondering if there's a crossover. By the way, I, I, I deeply don't, I deeply take as a matter of faith that all the things that we're talking about that, that people don't want to be conscious of that there's a brand to be created that becomes a friend of people with the disease, that gives them, gives them other people, gives them a sense of meaning, gives them a sense of progress. Um, because even in games, you can bore the crap out of people and make them go away. So you can cause cognitive dissonance and make them go away. You can cause decreasing value per session and make them go away. Um, and 
you know, you can spam the crap out of someone and make them go away.